Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Marva Booker Johnson. Marva is a graduate student in the Department of Linguistics at the Ohio State University. Her research focuses on morphology and language context, specifically within Bantu languages. Her current work investigates the effects of contact with Swahili on Kihehe, spoken in the southern highlands of Tanzania. Previously, she has worked with tone analysis in Manyika, a Bantu language spoken in Zimbabwe, uh, and Lubukusu, a Bantu language spoken in Kenya. Please join me in welcoming Marfa. She gives her talk, Tencent Aspect in Kihehe, with comparison to Kibena and Swahili. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. As Anna said, my name is Martha Booker Johnson, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Tencent Aspect in Kihehe, and I'm also going to be drawing comparisons to Kibena and Swahili. So this presentation is a part of ongoing work for my dissertation. So the big picture plan is to describe the Kihehe Tens Aspect system, investigate how Swahili contact is and isn't affecting the Kihehe system, and then relate the grammatical findings to language use, language attitudes, and metalinguistic commentary from speakers. So today I'm just going to focus on the first piece of this, but I'm interested in any thoughts you have about this presentation today or about the project in terms of the big picture during the question period. So I have two main goals for today. First, to give an initial description of the Kihehe tense aspect system, and second, to relate that description to the systems of Kibena and Swahili. This is ongoing work, so I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts and suggestions. Um, first, to give you some background about Kihehe, Kihehe is a Bantu language spoken in the Southern Highlands of Tanzania, and I've put a box around it here, so it's this fairly large area. Um, Ethnologue reports a speaker population of 1.2 million as of 2016, although this number is likely an estimate of the ethnic population. According to the Languages of Tanzania project, in 2008, Kihehe was the ninth most spoken L1 in Tanzania, with an estimated 740,000 speakers. Despite these large numbers, Ethnologue did recently change Kihehe's vitality status to threatened, which means that the number of speakers is decreasing, which matches my own observations as well as community member commentary. So despite this seemingly large number of speakers, um, Kihehe is under a lot of pressure from Swahili, which is the language of education, government, and wider communication. To give you some on the data collection, I work in a rural area in the southern highlands of Tanzania, and I give you the full administrative list. Um, I'm probably I'm going to be mostly referring to the Kihehe as being from Wuhunga because that's the ward um, where I have been working. And most of the data that I'm going to talk about today is from this past year, but some of it is from um, earlier research. And research was conducted using Swahili as the language of communication with some Kihehe as well. And then just to give you um, a more narrow picture, this is a forestry map, actually. Um, so here we have the region of Iringa in Tanzania. And then this is Mufindi district where the research was conducted. And even though I say that I was working in Igoda, the place I was working is probably closer to this dot for Luhunga um, than Igoda. So we're at the very sort of southern edge of the Kihehe speaking area. Um, I've been working in this community sporadically since 2014. Most of the data presented is from my recent research trips, but some items are from consultants I've worked with previously in 2014 or 2019. Um, so that within this past year, I've worked with eight consultants seven of whom are from Lahunga Ward, and one is originally from Nandala, which is a neighboring ward. All of them are native speakers of Kihehe, and all but one of them are bilingual in Swahili. Four of the consultants I worked with speak some English, and there's a big relationship between um, age and whether or not people speak English, as well as a big relationship between age and education level. Um, and people varied um, in their literacy, some people having no literacy at all to others who've completed college degrees. And consultants ranged in age from 26 to over 70 at the time of participation. The oldest consultant I worked with wasn't exactly sure how old she is. 
Um, I wanted to discuss briefly why I'm comparing to the two languages that I'm comparing to. So first, Kibena. Kibena is Kihihi's closest relative. Um, the languages are reported to be sometimes mutually intelligible. I think this partly depends on the di dialects involved. Um, and there is a boundary between the two language communities. So they're adjacent to each other and a history of interaction. And in some villages, you have both Kihehe speakers and Kibena speakers. A friend of mine um, is from one of these villages. And for example, her brother recently married a Bena woman. Um, so that would result in sort of a mixed household. Um, and there's also northern Kibena, sometimes referred to as Ihibena Yahavahehe, and I apologize for my Bena pronunciation. <laughs> so Bena of the Hehe, um, which is an interesting ideological um, fact, but also maybe suggests that there's contact going on along that language border. And then Swahili. Swahili is not an especially close relative, but it is genetically related and has typological similarity. But importantly, almost all speakers of Kihehe, and this isn't just true where I work, it's true throughout um, the area where Kihehe is spoken, are also speakers of Swahili, with most people being childhood bilinguals. So they learned um, either in school or a lot of people even before they started school. And as I mentioned previously, Swahili is exerting strong social pressure on Kihehe. So um, there's sort of an expectation that we would see some contact effects happening. Um, just for this audience, I wanted to consider whether Kihehe is a Rift Valley language. I think probably not exactly, but um, let's consider for a moment anyway. Um, so I just put some arrows here to orient people. So Iringa is down here, and then we have Gogo. Um, I know people in this group have also talked about, for example, Datoga, Hadza, Iraku. Um, so Kihehe is not especially far away um, in that there's only sort of one intervening language. Um, and there's evidence of a lot of contact with Gogo and Ruvu languages. Um, so this is from a paper by Nurse in 1988, looking at the genetic relationships of Southwestern Tanzania. And he notes that there have been mutual borrowing and contact effects between Hehebena and Ruvu languages. And also that they have shared innovations. Um, there's slightly more influence going north to south, so from Gogo down to Hehe and Bena than the other way around. Um, and then this was not something that I was previously aware of, so I was interested to read that there's a lot of South Cushitic terminology in um, Southern Highlands Bantu and nurse thinks that this points to that region as the area of older South Cushitic settlement. Again, this is within Southwestern Tanzania, not Tanzania as a whole, but um, I thought that that was an interesting collection or connection. So certainly not a central Rift Valley language, um, but could po possibly be seen as peripheral, especially due to contact with Gogo. But the area where I've conducted my research is actually far from the Gogo speaking area, bringing us a little bit farther away. All right after that sort of side excursion. Um, I wanna talk about some phonological preliminaries that are just sort of uh, relevant to the tense aspect system. And so it's useful to go over them first. So Kihehe has quite restrictive phonotactics that disallow vowel-vowel sequences completely. Um, although long vowels do occur in the language. And this is relevant for us today because the elision of vowels can obscure morphological information, making it harder to identify the underlying exponents present in certain forms. So especially if you have an exponent that is just a vowel, it can easily disappear. Um, so basically the general idea is that when you have a vowel followed by another vowel, the first vowel will delete and the second vowel will become long. So for example, if you have va i gula, they are buying, you will get vi gula. Um, and then a sort of variation on that general principle is that if the first vowel is e or u, 
then the first vowel becomes a glide. Um, so for example, if you have two equula underlyingly, we get twigula we are buying. Um, there are some other slight wrinkles to this, but um, for what we're going to talk about today, I think this gives the general idea that um, some of this morphological information can be um, elided. Um, it's also worth talking about the Kihehe tonal system. So Kihehe does not have the same sort of robust tonal system that we see in other Bantu languages. Um, it's quite highly predictable. And prominence is rarely contrastive in the verbal morphological system. Um, the only examples I have where tone or prominence contrast between two tense aspect categories is where segmental has material has been elided due to the vowel hiatus processes we've just seen. Um, prominence is frequently on the penultimate syllable. That might be due to influence from Swahili, but it's apparently also common in Kibena, so it might just be um, an inherited feature. Um, so tone pattern can be predicted from the tense aspect mood of the verb. And a high tone on the penultimate mora, like I was just saying, can be considered the default pattern. So we see examples here from the future, the intermediate past, the far past, and the subjunctive. There's also a group of inflectional patterns, not inflectional patterns. There's also a group of um, tense aspect mood combinations that have a high tone on the first vowel of the verb stem. Um, so subjunctive plus the object prefix. Um, Odin doesn't give this a grammatical label. I think it's maybe meant to be the negative subjunctive. Um, and then we woke up, so the recent perfect. Um, it's also worth noting that because adding something like an object prefix interacts with this, that it's not purely the tense aspect combination, that it's also other morphological factors. So Mtavangu in 2008 provides sort of a brief overview of the tense aspect system. And he characterizes the tonal patterns in slightly different terms than Odin does, focusing on the tone patterns on specific morphs or exponents. Um, but if I sort of reframe them as word level patterns, then it's easier to compare them to what um, Odin has to say. So um, reframing them in those terms, we get far past, middle past, and imperatives that have the penultimate uh, tonal pattern that we've seen. Mtavango describes the recent perfect as having low tone on the penultimate syllable, but this could be another way of characterizing a high on the stem initial syllable because subsequent syllables would then sound low. Um, also, it would be low in comparison to um, forms that have a high on the penultimate. Um, Mtavangu describes the near future as having a low tone on the final vowel, although this could be a way of describing a penultimate high. Um, based on my own data, I also find that the penultimate pattern is common and occurs in the largest number of tense aspect mood categories. I find that Odin's recent perfect, which I don't necessarily think is exactly a recent perfect, but we'll get into that, um, has stem initial high in my data, which agrees with both Odin and Mtavangu's descriptions. I find that the present simple has a high on the pre-stem initial syllable. Odin doesn't describe the present simple, while Mtavangu marks it as having a penultimate high tone. My findings do, however, agree with data that is presented in Nurse 1979, although that is quite a brief um, description. So that was a lot of details. So just to give a summary of that, um, there is general agreement that there is a class of verbs with a penultimate high and another class with a stem initial high. The details of the membership of those classes is largely agreed upon, but there is some variability. There's also possibly a class of pre-stem initial tense aspect mood combinations, but this bears further investigation. High tone assignment is likely impacted by object marking, negation, and other factors. Um, this has been seen, for example, in Kibena. Um, so a thorough investigation will be needed to gain a full picture. For our purposes today, tone is characteristic of certain tense aspect mood combinations, but is not necessary to establish the different categories present. All right, so tense in Kihehe, Kibena, and Swahili. Um, 
I don't want to just assume that everyone knows what a Bantu verb looks like, so I'll go over that briefly. Um, so Kihehe follows the sort of typical Bantu verb template. Um, this has been simplified a fair bit. So if you think things are missing, um, you're probably correct. I've pared it down. Um, so we get subject agreement marking. We get tense aspect marking. Object agreement marking, which is optional. Um, and then our verb root plus any derivational suffixes. I've glossed over that because I won't be addressing those here. And then the final vowel um, provides additional grammatical information. In kihehe, that can include aspect, modality, and negation. Um, kihehe verbs can also use auxiliary ver verbs to form other combinations of tense and aspect. In kihehe, the auxiliary verb also has typically has subject marking, although there are some exceptions and a final vowel, and it may have an additional tense aspect marker, although that's not especially common. Auxiliary verbs are followed by fully inflected forms that have a structure similar to the template um, above. Um, so this is to contrast with an auxiliary verb being followed, for example, by an infinitive. So Mtafango reports six tenses for what he calls pure hey hey. Um, which I think is probably spoken around um, Iringa City because the capital of the Hehe Empire was originally near to Iringa City. So I would guess that, that it's from that sort of area. Um, and I work quite far away from there. <laughs> um, and he reports three pasts, one present, and two futures. And in Luhonga, I find the same number of tenses, but there are some differences in one of the future tenses. Um, so this is just an overview, but I'll go through the pasts, the present, and the futures um, individually. Um, but we can see that these forms are the same. This is allomorphy, the ite versus ile. Um, so we have our subject marking, our tense aspect marking, and our final vowel. Um, and that is here as well. So there are three past tenses with different degrees of remoteness. The recent past is primarily a hodiernal or today past used for things that happened earlier on the same day. The middle past is used for yesterday or farther back. Um, consultants um, that I worked with reported that the recent and or how consultants I worked with talked about the recent and the middle past is almost identical to how Mtavangu describes them, that there's a fairly clear line um, between today and before today. The middle and the farther past, the boundary is a little bit more fuzzy. It's more contextual. It might depend on the person, um, et cetera. Um, but they are always sequential in that um, one is the closest and then the next one and then um, now we'll look at this present form or a non-past. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous. So this is just marked with an E. So the present tense is also used as a narrative tense once the time of storytelling has been established. Um, it also has some sort of progressive or imperfective flavor to it um, that exists, although you can also mark it for imperfectivity. So um, uh, the present may also be used for the immediate future, which is common in a lot of languages, um, although that's not something that I've really looked into yet. So the future is the place where we see really a noticeable difference. There is this unmarked future. And then there's this distant future, um, which looks Quite different. <laughs> um, so Mtavango identifies la as a marker of a remote future. Uh, consultants I worked with routinely identified constructions with la as the negative subjunctive. No one has ever provided a future reading of it. Like I cannot get people to do this. <laughs> um, instead, consultants used sa to mark remote future, and that's probably from the lexical verb kutsa to come. Um, my discussions with consultants suggest that the two future tenses, unlike the past tenses, are not strictly chronological. Instead, sa is used for the remote future, while the unmarked form is a generic future that can be used for any future time. 
Um, and interestingly, Mtavangu also identifies this more generic meaning for the unmarked future, um, despite the fact that the remote future um, is formally quite different. Um, some consultants also identified SA forms as being more uncertain than the unmarked form. That's something I haven't dug into too much yet, but um, it's an interesting possibility. So just to compare this to Kibena, as has been seen, Kihehe has six tenses, three past, one present, and two future. Kibena may have as many as eight tenses, um, although it's possible that some of these forms are variants from the, for the same tense rather than different degrees. So there's no completely agreement about that. Um, if Kibena has six tenses, then the distribution of tenses is nearly identical to Kihehe. Um, although it's unclear how much they align in terms of the time that they're describing. If Kibena has eight tenses, then Kihehe has one fewer past tense and one fewer future tense than its closest relative. Swahili, on the other hand, has only three tenses, a past, a present, and a future. Um, based on my own observations, Swahili speakers in Iringa seem to use the present perfect construction as a recent past in some contexts. Um, and it's possible this is due to influence from Kihehe. Um, and given the strong social pressure from Swahili, we might expect reduction of the Kihehe tense system, but so far there's no evidence of such an effect. The younger speakers I worked with had um, very similar contrasts and very robust contrasts um, that matched up with the older speakers. Um, finally, there's narrative tense in these languages. So Kihehe can either use the far past or the present non-past as the main narrative tense um, once the time of storytelling has been established. Eaton provides a detailed analysis of narrative in Kibena, um, simplifying slightly because it's actually kind of complicated. She finds that the far past and the consecutive are used for the main action. I haven't found something that's an equivalent to the consecutive in Kihehe, although it is, of course, possible that one exists. Um, Morrison, in her description of Kibena, says that Kibena narrative tense is marked either with ag or with ha, um, a borrowing from Swahili. And I'll note for those of you who speak Swahili um, that Kibena has lenition of k to h, so um, ha is cognate with ka. Um, Neither of these are present as narrative markers in my data. And then Swahili uses ka as a marker of narrative tense. Okay, so if you've taken all of that in, <laughs> we can talk about aspect in Kihehe, Kibena, and Swahili, which I'm sorry to say only gets more complicated. <laughs> so just to give you an overview, um, overall aspect is more similar across the three languages than tense is, um, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. I don't know if I have a good reason for not expecting that. Um, in fact, the only aspect that exists in Kihehe and Kibena that doesn't exist in Swahili is the persistive. Um, otherwise, the three languages have a simple or perfective form, an imperfective, an anterior slash perfect, and a habitual that is in the present tense. Um, the realizations of the aspects in the languages do differ, however, with Swahili relying more on paraphrastic constructions than Kihehe and Kibena. Okay, so our simple and perfective forms, and these are the same as what I was showing you for the tenses in Kihehe. And I've cheated slightly in lining these up, but you'll notice that these are identical in the past three is identical in Kihehe and Kibena. And then the past two is identical if you allow for the lenition of K to H. Um, I say I've cheated slightly because Morrison actually identifies this as past four and this is past three and this is past two. Um, but because of the formal similarities, I've lined them up like this for comparison purposes. Um, so we also see that this is the same as what Morrison identifies as past two. And then there's a past one form in Kibena that doesn't seem to have a parallel in Kihehe. And then for Swahili, there's just one form that um, aligns with all of those. Uh, the present is also identical in Kihehe and Kibena. I say identical, there may be um, small um, differences, but sort of broadly speaking. Uh, 
And then in the future, we see a lot of differentiation. And I think the most interesting thing to me about the future is that we see this law future form again in Kibena, which is sort of surprising to me because Mtavangu is documenting Kihei that's spoken north of the area where I work. And Kibena is south of the area where I work. Um, but so if both of those have a law future, it seems like we would expect to see that where I am as well, but we don't. Um, so it's interesting that that has developed. And then Swahili has one corresponding uh, future. All right, we also see a lot of similarity um, in the imperfective. So I mentioned before that there's some disagreement about uh, whether some forms in Kibana are variation or different tenses. Um, I've grouped them here as variants of the same forms. And we see, interestingly, that one of the variants matches up with Kihehe. So it's the top ones. Um, well, the other one is different. And it's worth noting that for kihehe, so ige is an imbrication of aga and ile, if that means something to you. Um, ag, so aga is our perfective marker, or sorry, opposite of that. Aga is our imperfective marker. And then ile is sometimes labeled as a perfective, except of course, it doesn't really make sense to have an imperfective perfective. Um, so, but in Kihei, this is really quite generalized. And so ile occurs on most of the past tense forms. Um, so that's quite expanded. Whereas we see that in Kibena, we can get this aga or a um, final vowel. And that that doesn't occur in my Kihei data. Um, we also notice that here for the imperfective, that these are all not compound forms in Kihehe and Kibena, but in Swahili, you need a compound for the past and the future um, imperfective. Um, also, I mentioned before that we can get uh, the, sorry, let me just time. Um, we can get, a little bit of imperfective meaning from the present marker e, but here we see that it can also be combined with the imperfective ag. So um, it's not completely imperfective by itself. Okay. We also have the anterior or the perfect. So this is a tense where we, um, or an aspect where we are relating the time of one action to another. Um, and these forms are more different in Kibana and Kihehe than the perfectives and the imperfectives that we've just seen. Um, in particular, Kihehe seems to have maybe reduced these auxiliaries um, that we see in Kibana. Um, that's my best hypothesis for where A and K came from, is that we get a reduction of Ave and of what would have historically been Kave into A and K in Kihehe. Um, so that might explain why um, those forms look a little bit different. Um, there are, this is also the one place where Kihehe seems to have more contrasts than Kibena does. Um, and in particular, there's um, all three pasts and then a uh, present perfect as well. Um, the present perfect is the same in form, so this non-past here, so F subject marker, stem, and then ile, is the same as the recent past, the simple recent past. I have put them, put the same form in both places just because there is a distinction that can be drawn here. So with a verb, a state of verb, like to be tired, um, this form would mean um, I was tired, but I'm not now. Whereas this would be, I got tired and I am currently tired. So this um, I designate as the present perfect because it gives us that I became tired and I'm currently tired type of meaning. Um, for, so we, for all of these, we see with the exception of this form, 
we do get compound um, tense constructions for these. And that's also true for Swahili. Finally, as I mentioned, persistive is the only tense that or aspect that exists in Kihehe and Kibena that we don't see in Swahili. So this is to still be doing something. Um, and you'll notice uh, probably right away that this does not have quite as many tense contrasts as some of the other aspects. Um, the constructions are fairly different looking in Kihehe and Kibena. Um, the Kihehe constructions are all formed with Pe. Um, this could be related to a locative relative marker that is used to mean when, um, but uh, it's unclear if that's where it comes from. It's also worth noting that the persistive is the only time that you can have an a uh, final vowel in the past tense in Kihehe. Um, unlike uh, in the other aspects. We do see pe um, here in this present Kibana form, but not in the others. Finally, um, there are is a habitual in all of the languages. In Kihehe, it's in the present tense only. You can um, make habitual constructions um, for other tenses, but the imperfective is used. So if it's, I used to go to school every day, you would just use the imperfective. Um, and that's not a compound tense, so it's just a simple tense. In Kibena, Morrison identifies a present and a distant past. So the present, unlike Kihehe, is a compound construction. So first there's that. And then the distant past is actually looks a lot like the far past imperfective in Kihehe and Gray um, actually identifies this form as a variant of the far past imperfective. Um, so as I was mentioning in Kihehe, the far past imperfective is used in a habitual type of meaning. So I think that's maybe what's going on here. And then Swahili as well, we get this present tense only with who um, and then the stem and then an awesome final vowel. And there's no subject marker on that. Okay, so just to wrap up, Kihehe and Kibena show strong similarities, uh, both in the categories they express and the exponents used to express them. This is not phenomenally surprising, they are closely related. Um, relative to Kihehe and Kibena, Swahili has a reduced tense system, but similar aspectual categories. Um, there are virtually no shared exponents of tense and aspect to, between Kihehe and Kibena and Swahili. Um, Kihei's tense aspect system therefore seems to currently still be quite intact, but it remains to be seen whether that situation will persist. Um, here are my references, and I would just like particularly to thank all of the consultants who have worked with me over the years, um, who have always been wonderfully, wonderfully patient. Um, and I will leave you with a lovely picture of a Hehe basket. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we can go to the answer and question section. I don't see any hands at the moment, so I'll start with a question of my own. Can you elaborate a little bit on the um, context in which you find, for example, this um, remote future, I think it was, the SA? Like, would you see any, like, I don't know if you have the data, but is there any difference between Kihei and Kibena there, for example, when you have the La and the Sa, or uh, like how, how is it commonly used? Um, yeah, well, I'm definitely not an expert on Kibena. <laughs> so I um, am not quite certain about that. I am looking for, I know I have an example of Sa where it was, um, I will do whatever the thing is that they were doing in 2028. So like that was an example that somebody gave me for that. Um, so definitely not in the near future, um, but quite a ways out. Um, and again, like I said, my understanding of that is that you could also use the generic future for something that distant, um, but that you, yeah, that I, my my assumption is that it adds a little bit of emphasis to the distance. 
um, because it was definitely dispreferred for something that was um, immediate or would happen right away. So it's, I think it's mostly that there's a prohibition on using it for sort of something that's very close. Prohibition is maybe a little strong. Dispreference. Does yeah, it does. Yeah, uh, thank you, Martha, for a great uh, work. Um, I'm wondering if um, you can ask your consultant about the historic past marked by A. Um, but also um, your consultants are saying la is only for negative, is a negative marker. But in my ongoing work is both a negative marker and a future marker. I'm also wondering if Swahil has no positive marker, uh, what about um, the word bado? Martha Bado Anawasirisha. Yeah, so you can make a persistive construction in Swahili using Bado. So for the people who aren't Swahili speakers, Bado means still. Um, so you absolutely can make a persistive construction, but it's not sort of its own um, morphological inflected category. That's the distinction I'm drawing is whether or not it's sort of... Um, its own morphological form. So for example, with the habitual, right, you can talk about the habitual in any tense that you want to, but there's only a, de um, a dedicated form for it in the present tense. Um, so that's that's the distinction that I was drawing. And um, that you, you, in terms of la as a negative marker and future marker, you can ask them about the he he song, ukangalage ukulima, so like work very hard, you will eat in the future. So in that context, la is not negating, but is mark is marking future. I I don't doubt at all that it exists because enough people have written about it that it must. Um so I I can try to ask again, but it's interesting that in the area where I'm working, it doesn't. Yeah. It's certainly not something people will volunteer. Um, but um, it'd be interesting to see if I get any commentary about, oh, that's how people talk in that other place, for example. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And then I see that there are some comments in the chats. Um, I think I'll come back to them because I think maybe Helen wanted to respond to this topic. So I'll just ask her to unmute first. Yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention about the futures and you were saying maybe it's certainty, maybe it's um, distance into the future. Um, one of the, I'm in Mbeya and uh, so not so far away. And for some of our languages, we found it helpful to look at the idea of a contingent future. And I just was reminded of that by that saying that we just heard, because if you do something, then you will do something. Um, so that might be a fruitful area of research. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will just read out what's in the chat. Um, so Jenya says, thanks, a very general question. I would love to know if you come across uh, any relevant literature on tense aspect mood in contact. Thank you. And then after that, she says, last, both a future marker and a negative marker in some varieties of Berber, namely in the parts of Sanhaya. Hmm. That's very interesting about law. Um, yeah, I think that's a good question about tense aspect mood in contact. Obviously, in terms of borrowing actual inflectional exponents, people usually say that's um, sort of the last one of the last things to be borrowed. Um, I would actually very much be happy to take citations about things where it's more sort of pressures towards changes in the categories. Um, so if other people here are more familiar with that than I am, I would very much appreciate that. Uh, and then there's a question from Aaron who says, thank you, Martha, for your presentation. Have you looked at dense aspect with negation? 
have you found any dedicated uh, negative tense aspect markers or would they just add a negation marker with the same tense aspect markers? I have not gone through this thoroughly yet, <laughs> but it's a great question. Um, some of the time it seems to be very straightforward. You just stick C on the front of the whole verb and that's it, you're done. Um, I have a few examples where I get both C and La on the same verb, so that's kind of fun. Um, I have not put them together in a way to figure out what might be conditioning that yet. Um, I also have noticed that I have some negative examples that have what I think is mpaka. So um, this, I need to check if it's indigenous to Kihei or if it's been imported. Um, but so that's in, if it means until. Um, and that was in some negative future constructions that I had from people. Um, so I think there are some interesting interactions between negation and tense and aspect. I am trying to get a handle on the affirmative first, um, and then I'll uh, get more into how negation interacts with it. Because um, yeah, there are just so many moving pieces. Then of course there's how object markers interact with it. Um, weird things happen there too. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a great question. All right, then um, thank you Marfa very much for the presentation. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Breath Valley webinar series can be found on our YouTube page and each uh, presentation is added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 10th of July, and it will be presented by Lizzie Poole and Helen Eaton on the topic of literacy. Um, so Martha, thank you again for the presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.